Welcome to uh, How to Scale Your Business. Um, I've just gotten thrown into this, and I'd like to start out by just letting everybody give a quick introduction of themselves and your 10-second elevator pitch. Tell us what you do. Kim, I'm going to okay. put you right on the spot. I'm Kimberly LePerry. I am COO for Valet. We are a site management and development company. Uh, we take sites and help them grow uh, specific to their needs and uh, scale up. We are long-term partners, digital partners, and uh, we're just full-on agency. So, hi. hi. Thank you. Uh, I'm still Andrew Norcross. I still run React, as of now, I still run React Studios. We're an agency based in Tampa, uh, distributed. We, we, do a whole, we do a lot of custom development, both in the custom plugins, we do uh, site builds, we're one of the VAP feature partners, and we like to focus on building things that haven't been built yet. Uh, still Kareem Maruki, and like Norcross, still CEO of uh, Crowd Favorite. But uh, my history for this panel is I've scaled four organizations from zero to over 35 million in services revenue. Uh, and uh, I want to bring that here to the WordPress community. That's on. Um, <clears throat> my name is Brett Cohen. I'm CEO of a digital agency called Imagine. We're outside of Boston. We also have an office in Delray Beach. Um, I've been, I'm an overnight success. It just took me 20 years. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually filling in for my partner, Bill Gadless, if, whose name is in your program. He's sick, so I'm going to do my best. And, and just let's go back down the road. You, you said this, but how long have you been in business? Um, I built my first website in 1996. Okay. So 20 years. Is that 20? Yeah, 20 years. Yeah. That is 20 years. Congratulations. 94. Uh, 2008. Okay. Valet has been uh, fully up and running for four years. So. And let's start off by defining scale. What does scale mean? And what does scale mean to your business specifically? Who wants to, who wants to go first on that? Just jump in. It's okay, Brett, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think from us, uh, for, for our business, it's, it's scaling uh, employees, obviously, you know, how, how big of a company we are. I also think it's the um, types of projects that we work on and, and have worked on, you know, starting in 1996 with our first project, or my first project, it was $800. So scaling from that to where we are today with the number of employees and when to add those employees and who are those employees, especially the, the, the first few, those are the key ones. Um, I think that's what it means to us. Okay. So for me, scale is a formula. And it's a formula of type of project, revenue, and employee per revenue. In the services business, really, uh, whether you're doing value pricing or charging by the hour, at the end of the year, your profit and loss is going to come down to how much money you're making per billable employee. And you know, uh, a scale that's used a lot in uh, professional services is a minimum scale of, for instance, $100,000 a head. So, can you get multiples on that? Can you get to 200? Can you get to 300? Can you do like Bain Consulting does and get over $400,000 per head in revenue? Uh, that's what scale means, whether you're doing it for the enterprise space or you're doing it for medium-sized projects or if you're doing it for uh, small-sized projects. And it's a little bit different with the product world. Yeah, for us on, on the service side, they've pretty much outlined it. It's It's the type of project, the scope of project, the, you know, our ability to handle those projects, uh, employee count, things of that nature. On the product side, it's how much market saturation we're able to get, uh, where the marketing reach goes, uh, where we're able to find uh, product revenue, where it matches up with needs in the community from a user base, from a development base, like things we can actually build that are realistic for us to build, maintain support compared to what the market will bear from a pricing standpoint and actually being able to determine where those numbers go and, and be able to manage multiple commercial products out in the same space at the same time without having to have a whole lot of overhead to constantly manage and keep them going. 
Yeah, for us it's a lot of the same, uh, trying to make sure that we can bring people on, add on new services, do it in a way that's profitable. I think one of the major concerns for us scaling was to ensure that we could grow in all of those areas, money, revenue, services, processes, systems, but do it in a way that retained the quality of service that we wanted to, to have as part of our company. So when it's, when it's time to scale, what do you use as a measuring stick? I use lack of sleep. <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, jokes aside, like where what happened for me, like, was I realized that I was spending a lot of time, you know, I, I would have a full scale, a full scope of work to do, and then I would have to do all the other work to manage the work that I was doing, and you know, I was getting to the point where I was doing 80, 90, 100 hours a week. Uh, I was not sleeping ever. Like people, like I had to switch my phone to 24 hour time because I was, didn't know if it was 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. anymore. <laughs> it's funny, but it was legitimate. Like, yep. you know, people were starting to get worried about me. And, you know, things like people thought I had like auto tweet set up because they'd see it like two, three hours apart, 24 hours a day. I was like, no, I just don't sleep anymore. Um, and that was when I kind of learned, you know, realized that something had to give. And that was where I figured, okay, is the revenue high enough? Where do I need to scale? You know, because it was it was never just like, oh, I need another developer. It was okay if I'm spending all this time doing admin stuff. Maybe I need to get a part-time person just to handle things like invoicing and bookkeeping and and just the things that take me away from my core competency. There's so fat fatigue is your measuring stick. That was there's my first there's one. so much okay. truth to that. Good, good. So much truth. It's it's panic and cold sweats, right? Like at some point when you realize I can't do this, my hands are too full, or you lose sleep for consistently over a single issue or a problem, something comes back over and over again. And we've learned from that, thankfully. We sleep a little better now, but we started tracking the work that we do in, in measurable numbers. You know, how many tickets do we answer? How many hours do we spend? How much money goes out per lead that comes in? So we've started tracking things that we can measure and create relationships between to, to determine when that is. So we sleep better than Norcross now, I think. But <laughs> To riff off of what Norcross said, the measuring stick of when to do that is exactly that, are you too busy for X? But what's interesting is, in my opinion, if you're a smaller organization, um, don't hire to double what you're doing. Hire specifically what your weaknesses are. So if you're horrible at writing, hire a writer. If you're a great developer and you don't do design, get more into, hire for your weakness, whatever that may be. That'll help you faster than doubling down on what you're already doing. Then once you have filled some of those weaknesses on whatever that is, um, then move on to actually uh, trying to get depth of expertise. Because if you're already a successful entrepreneur or a small agency, you already have that expertise and you're being recognized for that expertise. So. I think in, um, <clears throat> in our case, and you know, maybe in, in your, some of you, your case, uh, it was it was just about the checkbook. It was you know looking in that checkbook and not seeing any money in there. So our scale was we need sales, so um, and need customers. So our our actual first employee was a was a cold caller, and and you know our our method was let's get customers and then we'll figure out how to get the job done. And then it's pressure from clients. So we take on too much. We sell, sell, sell. Take on too much work. And then we say, okay, now we got to hire some people to do the work. And that's kind of how we did it over the years. So you're, you're scaling, you're identifying where you need to scale based on uh, a hole or a void or a weakness. What if I'm not able to identify that weakness for myself? If you can't, someone else will. Yeah. Tell me about I, that. I mean, like, no, I'm, I'm, that was a serious question. Yeah, so my, tell my me about that. My experience was, uh, like, I was having issues. I would forget to invoice clients. I would, would you think you would never forget to get paid? I would forget to get paid. Uh, I would launch sites and forget to tell them that it was live. Uh, I would not answer emails because I was just so busy that I would be like, all right, I'm not answering, I'm not looking at email from this time to this time because it's too distracting. And then there'd be so many emails that were there. I'm like, all right, well, which ones are super important right now? And I forget ones, okay, I'm gonna respond to that, but I gotta do some research and then it'd be two weeks later. Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, the leads, I wasn't able to respond and keep getting the work from the leads because I wasn't, I didn't have enough time to respond to the leads that I was getting. And, you know, that was, you know, that was, it became apparent to me when like new work was slower and slower coming in because I simply didn't have time to actually get it. Like they were coming to me from a record, you know, they were a referral recommendation. Mm -hmm. Essentially all I had to do was say, hey, was yes, I could do it and it would have been mine. 
but I didn't even have time to say yes. And you know that, that became readily apparent when those things stopped coming in. Yeah, sometimes um, you'll, you'll figure it out from going to an event like this. For us, we went to a builder.com show probably in 1999 and, and sat through sessions and, and it, was, it was the first time that we actually heard the concept of a project manager and we, will, we said, because it was just us doing the work. So sell, 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 then at night do the work. He, my partner's at home doing design, I'm doing some development, we're uploading together. And we hired a project manager, our first one, and um, it really helped us out a lot. And it was, we wouldn't even have known about it or thought about it, even though we, we could feel the pressure internally, but we just didn't know what the answer was because we were so young and we just didn't know. And going to a conference, we, we started to hear other people talking about the notion of, hey, a project manager, and you should have a project manager, and, and we kind of bit the bullet and hired a project manager. And, uh, and every single hire, especially at that time, was like a big dilemma. How are you paying them? You know, do we have enough business? Do we have enough clients? So it's a, it's a struggle, which is why I, I said earlier, those, those key initial hires are, are uh, big decisions. So, I mean, we, we've heard a little bit in, in the other panel, we heard some of this panel today about, about risk. You know, what we're really talking about is risk. So how do I, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm covered this, a, 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 I'm, I'm asking a leading question on purpose, but how do I know when that timing is right, right? I've identified my weakness, right? I, I've identified that I'm, 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 uh, I've got fatigue, I'm lacking sleep, right? I'm not invoicing, right? I need this. When do I know when the time is right? When do I pull that trigger? Usually, by the time you know, it's been for a while. Okay. Uh, for me, it was, you know, common. It was a few things that I realized that, like, for a good two, three month period, that I needed to have done this, and it was where I'm like, okay, either I can keep not, I can keep putting this off, I can keep not doing it, and I can basically sink myself. Or it is risk, absolutely risk. A lot of it's blind risk. It's just it was. I'm going to do it. Um, the first person that I hired, uh, you know, brought on his contract. He's now partner in the agency. Um, I vetted his code for 10 minutes because um, I had so much work that needed to be done. I didn't have enough time, like, to go through and be like, it looked, that looks good. And that was and that was it. And that was the extent of it. I didn't know him. Uh, he and I are obviously are not very good friends, but and it worked out extremely well. I mean, as much luck as anything else, but. Um, it got into that point where like I didn't have enough time and I didn't have enough resources to go through a large process of doing this thing. I just had to just do it. And if it didn't work, I would have had to deal with it. But at that point there, I didn't really have much of a choice. I was kind of backed into a corner. And I know Josh and he's right. He was extremely lucky. Josh is a great partner. And the same thing happened with me when we started what is today crowd favorite. We had a small team and we didn't realize that we needed to scale on one particular aspect until quite literally an existing client decided to leave the organization he was with and I thought to myself he'd really be good for us he's got the right something that might add to us I started to think about it and talk to him and even though we didn't have an exact place it's like that skill set would probably be really good for us and he's now become my business partner. I had no plan, it just felt right. So go with your gut. Go with what you know is, is right for what you need to build. And what happens if I make a mistake? I think, you know, make a mistake and make it quick. Um, you know, I always say fail fast, don't be afraid to fail, but do it quickly and move on. The business we're in, it's a, we're all in, it's all labor. So it's not like you're making a mistake investing a million dollars in a printing press and then figure out that printing's dead. So, you know, you're, you're hiring people and if somebody doesn't work out, you just move on and hire someone else or, or say, oh, maybe, okay, we didn't need that person. We figured out we didn't actually need that person and you, you just move on. And, you know, there's, there's other jobs and there's other people and uh, people will move on from you in a heartbeat, and sometimes in business, if you when you want to grow, you have to do the same thing, even though it's very difficult to to move on. You take the risk and you learn from it. 
you take that mistake and you learn from it. You're paying attention when you fail, when you, you, you hit that wall and you go, gosh, this isn't right, this isn't a good fit, something's not going well, or a client comes to you and says, I gotta go. Um, you just, you take it and you use it and you move on and that's, that's what helps you to, to make the risk uh, next time with a little more confidence and with a little more certainty. So we've talked about scaling staff specifically so far. When do I know it's time to scale the type of projects I'm going after or the type of products I'm building? The, 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 the amount of money that I'm, I'm trying to tackle. The, a, from a, pro, from a, a services and, you know, standpoint, the reputation that we were able to develop, uh, sometimes in spite of myself, uh, we would, <laughs> I'm not the, the classiest, but um, <laughs> yeah, I know, surprises me too. But you know, the, the scale of, you know, my development skill got better. And, you know, especially when Josh came on, we had now had two people who had a solid development ability. You know, we, we knew people, you know, we were active in the community. We knew people that we could reach out to if we had a very particular thing that we were working on. So some of our clients grew with us. We maybe built them a, a simple website or a small plugin for something. And now two, three years later, they've grown and they need larger scale services. And well, they're like, well, you built it then. Can you build it now? And there's a lot of times where I felt like I felt comfortable with 90 to 95 percent of what they needed, and I was like, I can probably figure out the five percent. It wasn't like a 50-50 thing, or like I don't know how to do any of this, and I'm just going to say I can. It was like I know I can do almost all of this, and I can figure out that little bit. And let's talk. Look, I have an issue with your question, and my issue with your question is this. Not all scale of revenue is about getting a larger project. I know of more than two agencies in this particular community that do a really good job at volumizing smaller projects. And when they try larger projects, they'd fall on their face. Sometimes we'd help them. But it doesn't necessarily mean because I did a project of X size, my next project has to be of Y size. You don't need to necessarily do that. So what you're talking about is, is potentially scaling profitability. Yes. Correct? So with the, with the current project base, the current product base, current service base, scaling profitability. Let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, you kind of did, but, but how do I go about doing that? So those of you who know Crowd Favorite, they go, oh my gosh, you've grown so much in the last three years. What people don't realize behind the scenes is it's not a hockey stick. There are companies out there that grow like hockey sticks. Beware. Beware of anybody who's doing that. It's a stair step. Major growth, plateau, figure out what you're doing, optimize, deal with uh, trying to make sure you get your profit margins under control, try to get your processes going, so do a general check. Because I know there's a mix of people who work in agencies here and agency owners here, but not all people in agencies will be comfortable with the growth path of where necessarily the entrepreneur wants to go. Not everybody will, the, not all the same people will be on the bus three years in that were on the bus the first day, and that's okay. If you handle it right, you can help them get a job somewhere else if you want to move your agency, or maybe they do want to follow that journey with you, and then it's your responsibility as a business owner to help them scale their own service, their own set but if skill set but if you do that what will end up happening is you will grow almost a a fervent uh, desire of those people to see your agency succeed and work with you and they'll watch your profit margin as as much as you will so everybody everybody will will benefit from that our, our scaling and profitability was a for us, a lot of, you talked about risk and hiring, but it was also about risk and projects. We had some clients that would come on that we had great relationships with, and we were talking to them every day, and one of them would ask, well, do you do this? And we thought, why not? Well, like Norcross said, yeah, I, can, I can get most of that, sure, why not? And then somebody else asked, well, can you do this? And it was the same thing. So we went out on a limb, we tried it, and then we did it twice, and then we did it three times, and we said, okay, 
Is this something that we can add on to our services line? Is this something we can be profitable with? What is it going to look like to, to hire folks to do this or something we can handle in-house? So there's a lot of questions that come from it, but really it's you, you take that initial step. Talk to your, your clients, the, the people that you work with every day. I mean, that's how you figure out if there's even another stream, right? If there's something you might be interested in, but it might not even be relevant to what you're doing. That might be a, a different conversation altogether. But for us, that was the first step was actually just doing it a little bit um, or, or finding help to, to complete it when we did it most of the way. Yeah, I think it's <clears throat> looking internally and refining your business and figuring out what you're actually good at and where you make the most money internally. And once you can kind of separate out each individual piece and say, okay, I make a lot of money doing this and these are great projects and we have these great clients, um, you want to try to do more of, of those types of jobs and don't take on the, the ones that are on the outskirts because you might need the money at the time. You know, we've had so many projects over the years that we took that we knew were kind of outside of our range at the time, but we couldn't pass it up because it was the dollars. And then we take them and it kills our company, you know, because we're just not set up to do it. We had, it was too much stress in the employees. Um, it was, it just didn't work. And we, over time, have refined who we are. We have a really good sense of, of who we are, who our clients are, what are the types of projects we want to work on, and what we can actually execute on. And uh, we just, work really hard at, at just selling those types of projects over and over again. And we don't need to be everything to everybody. So there's a lot of stuff that's kind of outside our wheelhouse that comes in that we have opportunities for that we're just smart enough now, after 20 years, to be able to say that's not the right project for us. Now, in that kind of a situation, do you find a, a, a person that you can refer to? Do you have a network of people that you could refer, that you could refer those projects out to? Um, we're trying. So I would say, uh, historically, we've been in a bubble. Uh, just so busy with our own stuff, we spent 10 years on our own content management system built in .NET and launched probably seven or 800 sites just nonstop. Uh, we were like a little factory. And we, we weren't part of a community until really WordPress. And we, we just, we had some people who had worked for us in the past that if something that was too small for us came in, we would give it out to them. But then for whatever reason, when we referred it out and things went south, we ended up owning it. So we kind of stopped that. But yeah, now as we, as we move forward, we, we definitely, so if anyone wants to talk to me about stuff we don't do that you may be interested in, in taking on, I'm all, I'm all is. That's great. I've got a follow-up for both Andrew and Kim. When you got these requests for new services that were outside of your wheelhouse, um, as you took on these new services or as you approached these new services, were you completely transparent with your clients as to what your capabilities were and were not? It would really depend on what, it, I mean, if it was so far out of our wheelhouse that we just simply didn't know what we were doing, we wouldn't take it. Uh, if it were something where we have familiarity with e-commerce but we hadn't used this one particular package, We'd be like, you know, that's not one that we've normally used. However, we've done enough e-commerce work that, we're, that we feel confident. Um, internally, we'd be like, okay, if we're going to have to spend a little bit of time researching, we're not going to build that. That's on us. Um, if it's something where, you know, we dig in, we realize that this is just a terrible thing, I mean, we might be like, you know, we build milestones, so we both, either the client or us can kind of cut at certain points, and we're not stuck with a whole project that neither of us wants to do. Um, you know, we focus a lot on like foundational growth, where like the things that we've gotten better at and, and added into our services, like we've spent time making sure that we're actually confident doing it and we want to do it. Like there's work that we're qualified for that we couldn't, we couldn't be more bored doing so we don't do it. Um, and, and that's fine, like different people find different things interesting. Like we don't have design in house. We have designers that we work with when the client needs it. Uh, we've tried having design in house once or twice and for us it was horrible. And it wasn't worth the effort of the management and the, you know, the added revenue just, it didn't make sense for us. Uh, for other agencies, they couldn't think about not having design in-house. So yeah, there's going to be certain stuff that comes our way that, yeah, we know designers. It's not a matter of qualification. It's a matter of like, we're not going to project manage design. Uh, you know, like we're happy to build it when it's done, but we're not going to sit on timelines because you don't like the shade of blue. And you know, which, which is fine. That's design and that's great. And the people that love that stuff and I'm just not one of them. So, you know, that's where we kind of focus on, like, what we're, how far out of it is it really? Uh, 
part of it was just kind of gut, like, do we want to go there, do we not? And then whenever we would talk to the client about it, uh, we kind of internally talk about what that would look like and if we'd be willing to, to go after it. But yeah, we were always transparent with um, this, this isn't what we normally do. We're willing to do it for you, but we would always show up with a list of this is what we can get you. There was always some minimum guarantee of, I, we, we can do this for you. It, it's not going to have you know, star stripes and glitter, but you know it'll be it'll be here. You'll have a box, and it'll be done at the end of the day. Um, and if they were fine with that, that was that was great for us. And then we would use that to kind of over deliver, if possible, um, at the end of the day, so that we could exceed our own expectations and the clients. But it was a great way to learn. Um, be transparent so that they knew what they were getting at the end of the day and we felt confident that we could at least deliver something. And Kareem, how do you handle requests for services that are outside of your wheelhouse? So, full disclosure, you. <laughs> um, we that wasn't have, meant as a softball. Yeah, no, no. Um, we have commercial partnerships with Rebecca Gill of Web Savvy, with Zeke. Um, we have found different expertise in different verticals and we use those. And sometimes they go well, and sometimes after a couple of projects, we don't use them anymore. But we're always looking, and we're always looking to try and expand that. Because the more we verticalize, the more respected we get in what we do well. And that's really, you know, as, as important as it is to try and grow your business, which is what this panel is about. Um, it's important to make sure that you're seen as an expert or you're going to lose the base of why you're there. I'm going to open it up to questions. <laughs> yep. So I'm going to try to summarize, uh, and, this, and this, what I heard was, um, basic question is subcontractors versus hiring full-time employees. Let's start there. We've done that with almost every employee. Um, everyone that we've hired full-time has been on contract for a period of time first, just to make sure that we're a good fit, um, both from a culture standpoint and from an actual work standpoint, because, I mean, you can look at somebody's code and get a good idea if they actually wrote it or not, but sometimes it's every now and like there's some code that I've written that like that's amazing I don't know how I wrote that and I don't think I could ever do it again uh, then there's some stuff that I look at and be like clearly I was drinking Dayquil um, <laughs> because that doesn't even look like something I would do on a dare so um, you know we try to do contract for a period of time simply to make sure that everything's a good fit before before we bring them on board there's some people that we have existing relationships with as a contractor that they do very specialized things that like we like say buddy press we don't do a lot of buddy press work so we have one or two people that we know that that's the wheelhouse that's what they do that's what they love if we happen to have a project that that's a component of we'll bring them in because the amount of time that it's going to take us to get re-familiar with where it is from the last time we've used it is not worth that amount of time on our end whereas we'll bring them on even if it's a, a you know our rate compared to what their rate is even if that works out flat and it's not like extra, not a margin on top of it. We know that we have the expertise that we're not going to be spending more time internally learning a thing that we're not going to do a lot. Some things aren't worth contracting out, and some things aren't worth hiring someone internally for. You, to have somebody that has a specialty, a wheelhouse, that you can kind of bring in on projects. We, from day one, it's probably one of the few things that we did right from day one, was have a 30-day kind of onboarding, test-out period. You know, you, you, can, you can work for us, and we'll give you a check, but, you know, after 30 days, we're going to talk about how well you did. Um, and that has grown. We now have a 90-day boot camp where we push people through. Um, we make sure that we give them all the tools they need to succeed if we are looking to keep them on long term. So we'll push them through systems, we'll push them through our meetings and our processes, and then at the end of 90 days, we see, okay, is this a good fit? And that's, that's how we handle it now. Yeah, we've, we've <clears throat> had tons of contractors over the years, and um, you know, it's been a struggle to get the consistency of work that we're used to producing with our internal staff. and. 
the project managers that we have, they would just rather work with the people that they know and trust, and especially with tight deadlines, and we're, we're a volume shop, so we're doing a lot of projects. Um, and with, with the people that, that we, you know, well, let me back up. It's always bothered me, especially as we were adding people over the years, that our next employee always had to be a full-time person. You know, I, I, I wanted to not have to do that. I just, you know, there should have been a transitional process, but it's just so difficult um, for some reason for us to find qualified people uh, to do the work, even though we know they're everywhere around us. Uh, so I, you know, we have internal meetings where I say, maybe we just don't work well with other people. It's probably us, <laughs> because it seems like it seems like everybody else can do this except for us. So maybe there's something in our process. If we can't get people to work the way we work, maybe we need to figure out how to work the way everybody else works. And we've we've explored it. So uh, we're we're open for it. And we've traditionally been a traditional business where you come to the office and you work. And um, we're transitioning more uh, because of where we, we're located. We don't, there's not a huge talent pool. So we're, we're south of Boston. We're kind of right in between Providence and Boston. And we get nobody from Boston because they're just not going to travel that way. Uh, we get a lot of people from Rhode Island. Uh, but there's not a huge talent pool. So we have to, if we want to add qualified people, we have to add people outside. And we're struggling. I know there are companies that are just strictly remote companies, but we're struggling with that, that hybrid mode of traditionally being a, a traditional mm -hmm. shop and then adding remote people. You know, how do you trust issues and, and, and how do you manage them and that type of stuff. So we're a little bit the anomaly. Um, all our people are actual employees. Uh, some of the people who are well known in this community who are team leads for us, for instance, Carrie Dills, um, she is an employee, yet because she wants to do things in the community, she is an employee that is contracted, so to speak. Her contract says we give her 25% of her time back for the community, for her podcast, for working with the WordPress community, committing uh, code to the open source project. So she is an employee, yet we give her time back. Um, it's, we are a reflection of what our clients' wants are, and our clients want us to have employees that we have under contract rather than subcontractors. I'd like to add something to yeah. that. Because what, one thing that I think is a nuance, it's, it should be a nuance, but it's, it's very important. If you're considering full-time, part-time contractor, a, a portion of that is, um, is the work and, and what you're hiring for and, and the term. But the other, the other portion of that in, in the thought of scaling and profitability is the revenue that you're going to have to have and maintain to keep that person on board and continuously pay them month after month after month after month. So if you're looking at a short-term project where you need somebody and you're like, oh, maybe I can use them later on down the road, but you don't know, that's a good instance where you would just default to a contract situation because you don't want to promise somebody something and you're going to have to take that back after a while. So a part of that equation is going to be the, the revenue, you have to have that money before you hire that person or make sure that you can maintain it after you hire them because if not, it doesn't matter who you hire or what for, you're still out somebody at the end of the day. I was actually going to ask that as a follow-up question and then I was going to duck behind <laughs> Brett. <laughs> Do any of you use overseas resources? We haven't personally, um, because the people that we've brought on as employees, so we're not big enough to deal with foreign tax issues, and that's just a scale issue that, you know, it's not the extra overhead and work and money to pay one foreign employee, we're just not there yet. Um, at some point, we hope to be. Um, I'm sure that, you know, like, we never wanted to just bring in work and contract it out and just kind of, like, be a storefront that no one really knew, because eventually, yeah, it does reflect on us. and. At times, it was like, if I have the time to QA all of this code that someone I don't know wrote, I had time to write it to begin with. And, you know, we would rather do a little bit less work and just know kind of what was going out the door than try to shepherd a bunch of stuff that we don't know, and then they disappear, and then it's, then I got to write it anyway, so. We, we've tried with contractors and epic fail. And again, it might be the way we work, um, you know, it, was, it, it could have been a, a difference in time zone. It was too much. Um, trouble com with communication between our people and 
and uh, and and the and the and we've tried both companies where we've hired a company that's was supposed to give us dedicated resources. We just haven't been successful um, doing it. So we uh, we actually have an office in Romania, and when I found an individual that we wanted to hire in Romania, actually flew over there, started a small business in Romania, paid the corporation tax to start a business there, <laughs> hired him as the first employee there, and today we have 15 employees in Bucharest. Um, it's not as complicated as, as it sounds. It just takes the effort to figure out what country and what their laws are and just talk to somebody who's done it before. Um, but it is more expensive at the beginning to figure that out and find the right cultural fit because people talk about offshore, there are giant cultural differences uh, around the world. Um, and you know, depending on what your personality is and your work culture, um, you need to find the right fit. And, and thank you for mentioning that, because I was going to say, as a follow-up, it does vary from country to country, right? You have to know yeah. what country and what personalities you're dealing with. That, that's where it becomes hard to manage. Yeah. Yep. So that's a great question. Actually, we didn't really cover that, but let's cover that now. So let's talk about pricing models and as, related, as it relates to scalability, uh, time and materials versus value-based pricing versus any other models you might have. At the end of the day, you're trading time for money. Uh, it really doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, there's some people, I mean, and some models work for like a, a single person, like a Curtis McHale uh, lives in Canada, does a lot of e-commerce work, membership site stuff, really good. Um, he does value-based pricing. He talks up and down. It's, it's, it's absolutely the best way to go. For him, it makes perfect sense. He's one person. He has X amount of time. He charges X amount for that week or whatever. And he knows he's going to get a certain amount of stuff done in that week. Works totally fine for him because he's the only person in charge of his time. As soon as you start adding employees and you're, you know, you're tracking multiple people's time over multiple people's projects, that model breaks down a little bit. Um, and you're still paying your employees for their hourly time because your employees don't really care what your pricing model is. They care what the paycheck says. So at that point, again, you're trading time for money. How you want to trade it and what you want to label it is, is really just window dressing. Value-based pricing is hard. <laughs> it's very hard. We, we've embarked on, on, on that journey. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the major lesson is how you present your pricing to your client. And how you factor it internally or what you label it or, again, it's, it's, you're, it's, time, it's time for money. And um, you, we found, uh, one example, it, it's a lot easier to talk to clients about, about doing work if we don't talk about what's this, this many hours. You know, we'll say, oh, it's going to take this three days or something. It's, it's really just in how you present it to them, how, how you calculate that internally. You don't have to be that transparent with them, right? You can just, you can give another, um, another subset of, of what it is you're going to be giving them, but but yeah, that's value-based pricing is very hard. Uh, it's doable, but like you said, with one person and a larger scale project is probably the better way to use it. So I'm a giant fan of value-based pricing, with one caveat: the top two percent of enterprise clients don't even start the conversation. They will rip your argument to stretch shreds. But outside of that, uh, value-based pricing works. And it works better and better the more experience you have at pricing your own projects. Um, because what you can do is if you can control those costs, you can control your profit margin. And you're not talking about hours, you're not talking about dollars, you're talking about a fixed price. We do that a lot with a lot of our clients. But it's quite literally like walking up to a craps table or a roulette wheel if you don't have a very solid process for pricing. And we, we probably spend 30% more in the estimating process than any one of our employees would like. But the reason we do that is so that we can lock that down and understand it. We have mul multiple iterations where we have the people doing the estimates or 
being questioned and talking with uh, management and the client, and it just goes back and forth. You're like, why would it take you three weeks to get me a price? It takes us three weeks to get you a price because we're going to make sure we've covered all our bases and it's going to be a fixed price. And if something happens that is in our control, it's our problem, not yours. But then you also have to have very important scope creep and scope uh, management. I, I know there's, a, there's several other questions in the room, but we are out of time on this one. So I'm going to invite the panelists to step outside if you have any further questions for them. But a uh, big round of applause for all four. This is great.